So, hello everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my brother, uh, Matthew. And uh, some of you might have seen Matthew. We did a, a conversation with Jordan Peterson, all three of us, discussing the story of Abraham. And so, um, Matthew and I, we're used to speaking, we're used to talking about symbolism together. We've been talking about it for, I mean, since we were teenagers. And so, we, we, we decided that we're going to try to have these, this conversation online to, uh, to talk about what symbolism is, you know, what are the categories and, and what are the criteria for a proper sy symbolic interpretation of a story. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to do it because we have our own shortcuts and our own way of, of talking about things. <laughs> so we're going to make a big effort to, to be comprehensible to everybody. So, so here we go. So, so, um, now I even have to use your name in English. I'm used to speaking to you in French. That's not going to be easy. All right, so, so uh, I'll call you Mathieu because I can't say Matthew. That's not possible. <laughs> All right, so Mathieu, one of the things that one of the things I want to start with is uh, the, I've been getting a, a lot of the comments that I'm getting about, about symbolism, and, and they, these comments keep, uh, keep coming back. And I tried to address it a little bit in my... Um, my video about about uh, symbol symbolic versus literal interpretation, but people seem to really want to oppose those two things. They really want to oppose this idea of like a factual, literal world and then a world of meaning. But for both of us, in in our in our discussions, it seems like that is just not how it works. So maybe we can start by giving us your your vision of that, and we can start the discussion that way. Yeah. Well. Um... I think that's one of the major problems with people and symbolism today is that we understand the world in a completely different way as it used to be understood. And um, it's such a fundamental difference that trying to understand the world in a truly symbolic way requires such a transformation of your, of your, of your mind, of your uh, presuppositions. Um, it's a really hard pill to swallow. Um, to be able to understand symbolism in a way that won't force you to make um, an, a distinction between meaning and fact. So if you um, if you're used to thinking in a materialistic way, which we all are, everyone's a materialist today, in my opinion, because science has completely um, dominated everything. Um, so it it it, it it's. It's helped us to understand a lot of things, but it's also hindered us to understand other things in a completely different uh, field of things. So, um, so basically, if we want to recapture what symbolism really is, we have to go way back and think of the universe in completely different terms as we do today. So basically, uh, the way we understand things today is... Um, we interpret everything everything in terms of matter and energy, basically, and structure. So <clears throat> that's how everything's understood. The only causality left today is a sort of mechanical causality where there's a transfer of energy or transfer of matter. or uh, So it's a mechanistic way of understanding reality. So if you understand reality like that, you can't really understand symbolism the way it was the way it was understood in the past and the way it's described in the Bible so yeah. that's I mean I think one of the ways that I've been trying to to help people to see symbolism again is to try to get people to dive back in in their experience to to kind of go back to the lived experience let's say so the way that you encounter uh, a tree is not the same you don't encounter a tree in the same category that a scientist would analyze a tree or the way you encounter you know the heavens or the way you encounter earth they're not the same categories and so trying to get people to 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 go back to categories and and the the, the craziest thing is that those the symbolic categories are are really they're there at the base of our of our existence and they're yeah. still there even if we, they're still there today right yeah. even if we pretend that they're not like you know categories like high and low you know yeah. you know even even things like hot and cold like hot and cold are not scientific categories they're categories of experience and so these these basic categories of experience there there are still hierarchies there's still and they still have exactly the same meaning as they used to 
Um, it's all still there, but we don't interpret it in the right way um, to make it significant enough to, to um, pay attention to it. Yeah, so one of one of the ways that 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 you've talked about that you talked about to, about to me before, and that you've even written about in some of your texts, is this idea of at least for a moment, uh, at least for let's say the 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 experience to try to to get a sense of how things come together and have meaning is to to for 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 a specific moment to shut down to try to shut down the the let's say the 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 quantitative you know scientific way of, of yeah. approaching the world you know so so i mean and it's the the craziest thing is it's not that that hard to do i remember no, because I remember we hearing, we we still think in the other way right. in a lot of in a lot of ways. I remember hearing recently a podcast with Sam Harris, and, and he was talking about he said he said something like when you drink water, it doesn't matter what you think, you're always drinking H two O. And I'm like, that's not true. No one drinks H two O. We drink yeah. wet. We drink cold. We drink warm. We drink you know flavor. Refreshing. That has nothing to do with. I mean, not it has not not completely nothing to do, but yeah. the the category of of two, you know, hydrogen and and uh, in a, is like yeah. it's not it's that's not the same as as the categories of experience. Yeah. Yeah. So the only problem with that, I guess, is that people will think that it makes it arbitrary, which which it doesn't, because there's still universal experiences that all humans have. It doesn't mean it um, because it's it's um, interpreted through the lens of of our consciousness. It doesn't mean that it's arbitrary in the sense that every anybody could say whatever they want, can interpret it however they want. Yeah. Uh, so that's the only problem with the idea of bringing it back to your experience. I agree with that's what people have to do, but they have to keep in mind that the human experience is is a universal experience. Some things are universal in the human experience. We all eat, we all sleep, we all work, we all rest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. The human experience is not random or yeah. arbitrary. It's and universal. It's, and in a way, it's funny because to get to true symbolism, you almost have to go, you almost have to destroy what people usually think what it is to give meaning to something. It's like you have to go beyond the emotional or personal, you know, uh, version of what happens and then go back to the really basic, basic ground level kind of almost you know, prime primordial experience yeah, exactly. of something. It's like so so the grass the experience of the grass isn't that isn't like that, you know, that, that nice Saturday that you spent with your family and now the grass for you reminds you of that mo that nice moment that you spent. You know, the, the 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 reality of grass has more to do with the fact that it's below your feet, that it's it's down there, you know, that it you know that it's it's all these it's a, like a chaotic mix of different things that are just there at the at the uh, on the on the surface of the earth rather than you know that but maybe that participates in the <laughs> reason why laying in the grass on that nice saturday was a pleasant experience probably it does actually but you have to go beyond that little that like psychological uh literary type of interpretation to get to the baser uh reality yeah but just because it's it's interpreted um, through human consciousness doesn't mean that it's like a personal individual interpretation. It can be, but those that's not how symbolism works because I don't care about some person's individual interpretation of something when it when that interpretation is based on nothing but their little ideas. Uh, symbolism becomes important when the interpretation is universal. I mean that's one of the criteria which, by which we can distinguish um, real symbolism from the kind of symbolism you can find in a movie or, or in a story that's, that's just been made up by someone on the street. Um, and even then, most of the time when people tell a story or, or, or write a movie, they will use universal symbols because otherwise nobody would care. Exactly. So, even when it is interpreted through individuals, if they want people to care about their their interpretation of reality, they'll make it universal. Otherwise, nobody cares. Right, and so in a way, the idea would be to say that symbolism is really, it's really the way that our 
our consciousness is written in a way. It's like it's what it's what it's what makes us what makes it possible for us to even perceive and engage the world is these basic structures that are that are that we're made out of, you know, that are that our experience is made out of. Uh, I mean, that's symbolism. It's really very I mean, it's really at the base. It's really what makes us what makes it possible for us to engage with the world. That's the, the same the same structure as the religious the religious hierarchy like the religious symbolism yeah so yeah um in fact the, the the basic structures of symbolism are so universal that even people who would like to deny them are 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 into those structures they they can't escape it so like a scientist let's say even an atheist um he's working on, on, on a scientific discovery or something like that. He's trying to perform an experiment. He can't escape the basic structures of symbolism. So, so what is this person doing? He's trying to unite a theory that he has, an abstract theory, a metaphysical idea. He's trying to join that with the facts that he observed. So the, this scientist is, he's, a human between heaven and earth trying to mediate between heaven and earth. He's trying to mediate his abstract theory with a concrete fact. So the scientist, whether he likes it or not, is participating in the symbolic worldview. He's, he's a mediator between heaven and earth, whether he likes it or not. And when I say, uh, I talked about this with when I when talked to Jordan Peterson, when I say heaven, I mean meaning. So theoretical meaning um, and when I say earth I mean the factual reality concrete reality and that's what it means in in the Bible and that's yeah. what it means in in pretty much all traditions so um, yeah and it's funny because I made I made recently I made that video about how science is nested in religion trying to talk a little bit about that as well and and it, it was funny because just what is it like a few a few like a week later I heard I heard I I, I I hate always harping on Sam Harris, but I heard I heard Sam Harris speaking about the the phenomenon of emergence, and he was talking about how we see these different these different patterns appear at different scales of reality, and how you know like uh, let's say the same patterns appear uh, at a at a biological level that on, as a city, and he was trying to like he was really struggling to to make those jumps those qualitative jumps between you know quarks and and atoms to you know a person to a city to and he, and he used he kept using the world higher order phenomena he kept using this hierarchical language about these higher orders of 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 manifestations and i've thought wow man you're 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 a religious thinker you don't you don't even know it <laughs> yeah and i think i i i listened to that also and i think the answer was also interesting because what the person said is you don't want to explain higher levels of phenomenon with the lower levels because it's extremely complex. Yeah, that's it's not so what Sam complex. Harris wanted, though. Sam Harris didn't like that answer. <laughs> okay, I don't know. But the it, other, it, the other the, uh, scientists did. Well, go ahead, keep going. Yeah, so it, it's so extremely complex that giving an explanation at that order would probably be impossible. And even if it is, it wouldn't be coherent to us as humans. You see, so right there, yeah. it's important. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from the fact that we are humans. We are observing phenomenon. We can't abstract ourselves from the equation of knowledge. So the scientist, the materialist tries to step away from the universe and look at it as if he's not in it. Yeah. And which is fine to a certain degree, and it's fine to understand such certain things like mechanical causality. The perfect way to do that is to abstract yourself from, from reality, but you still can't escape the other reality, which is the ancient way of thinking, where it's centered on, on the human. It's centered on consciousness. And um, so basically the scientist can try to create a worldview in which he's not there, and in which his theories don't exist yeah. in that model of the universe, but it's problematic for certain things. It's problematic. So it, it's also probably problematic to include it 
So there's a reason why science has discovered, materialistic science has discovered a whole bunch of things that the traditional worldview hasn't discovered. Yeah. Because it's useful to get out of this system. But so ideally, I think. It reaches that, a limit, though. At some point, it reaches it, its limit. It ha I think it has yeah. reached that limit. I think, I think quantum physics is one of the signs that this limit has been reached because they reached a point where the observer can't can't get out of the equation. So right. you have to admit as an observer that when you look at the phenomenon, you you are impacting the phenomenon. There's no way out. Now there's no way out. Yeah. So they they have reached that limit. And so it's going to come to them soon. They're going to have to deal with that limit. I don't I don't think they're dealing with it. I think they're going to have to deal with it though. I mean, what it does it mean? Like yeah, it seems like there was a whole bunch of things that happened at the mid, at the mid, maybe like post-war period, that because it was not, it wasn't just that observation, but it was also Goodell's, Goodell's theorem, incompleteness theorem, yeah, incompleteness theory, same and, problem, right? And then, and then Heidegger, I think, I think Heidegger was part of that, and this Heidegger presenting the idea of presenting this idea that you. The, the, the way that being presents itself to us, like I was saying at the beginning, the way that we encounter the world as, as consciousness is not the same as, the, as the, the technical, let's say, kind of scientific way of viewing the world. And that you cannot, you, you can't discount the other completely. You just, you just can't because then you don't know how to act in the world. And so it seems like, it seems like maybe it's, it's taking a while for people to kind of come to the, to the finality of what that's going to give, but I mean, hopefully, this is this is it. This is happening right now that that people are going to start. And I think that one of the things that Jordan Peterson seems to be doing is tapping into that uneasiness yeah. that people have about seeing the limits of science, but then coming at it from a scientific point of view and trying to to, to help people see it without completely, without without because. People without becoming in, insane. Yeah, yeah, without becoming. <laughs> no, it, seriously, because you can, if you if you delve too much into this kind of universe of self-referential contradiction, you you can go insane. So you can lose everything. So the idea is not to. I mean, my interest in in traditional cosmology um, doesn't come at the cost of, of of scientific knowledge, in my opinion, not at all. Uh, they're not opposed. They are, but they shouldn't be. They they should they should team up, yeah. if possible. So, <laughs> but one of the things, the people who are materialists have to understand if that is going to eventually happen is that traditional cosmology should not be interpreted in terms of materialism. Right. Because when you do that, it's ridiculous. So they're right in a way. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But when they laugh at religion, when they laugh at um, the religious worldview and the traditional worldview, they find it ridiculous. They're right. Because the reason is they're trying to look at it with their own lens, their own materialism. They're trying to look at something that's fundamentally not materialistic. So, yeah, it doesn't work. It's yeah. ridiculous. But the, the worst part of that is that is that it's not just the, it's not just the, 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 the atheists that are doing that. They're reacting to religious people doing that. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and then, and then interpreting the religious, uh, cos the traditional cosmologies with their materialist point of view, and then saying absolutely ridiculous things in doing so. And so, yep. they, ah, so the atheist has every reason to mock them. Exactly. That that's totally that's absurd. why I have zero animosity towards towards atheists. I have zero animosity <laughs> towards uh, skeptics because yeah. they're not. They're not responding to religion, really. They're responding, they're answering to the problem of people who are essentially materialists and don't know it and interpret the Bible, for example, with materialism. And even though it doesn't work, they still stick to it. So, so I think you gave an example in one of your videos. I'm not sure which one, but um, the, an example of, so you ask somebody, what does it mean when it says he went up into heaven? Yeah. So let's say, for example, Elijah goes up into heaven. What does that mean? Does it mean that he goes up into the atmosphere and then into, into outer space or something like that? It <laughs> becomes ridiculous immediately. Yeah. So there has to be a stage where people who are scientifically minded stop interpreting it like that. Okay. Don't worry about what 
certain um, religious people say, uh, if they interpret it like that, it's not. It's that's not what has to be critiqued. That's mm -hmm. simply wrong. What has to happen is we have to re-understand what it means to go up into heaven. Yeah. Okay? Or, that's just an example. Pretty much everything has to be, in a way, reinterpreted according to a cosmology that allows it. And that cosmology is is the one I, I was describing with Jordan Peterson. It, it, it's a man is a mediator between heaven and earth. And that's how things have to be interpreted in, in the Bible. Yeah. So when it says go up into heaven, you have to interpret it like that. It, it, with, heaven has that meaning. It doesn't mean the atmosphere. It doesn't mean that. So, Yeah, it doesn't mean the atmosphere uh, at the same level that when, when Sam Harris says higher level phenomena, it means that one phenomena is stacked on top of the other. Like you, can't, you can't use the language of hierarchy exactly. to describe this... this, this these higher levels of manifestation and then mock the idea of oh you're silly sky god in heaven it's like yes you're using the same word they're using exactly the same language yes exactly you're using the same structure but you're mocking mine yes but that's the thing they're not mocking your structure right. they're mocking the people yeah who still insist on interpreting it in a in a materialistic way as in the way the one you were just laughing at it means going up into the atmosphere. So they are not mocking that. They're mocking the people who still interpret it in a way that doesn't make sense. If 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 we can make people understand what it means, then I, I don't think there's going to be as much discrepancy between right. science and traditional cosmology. In fact, I think there's none. Yeah. Because they're not talking about the same things, hardly ever. And what, what's interesting and what I found in kind of my own research is what one of the difficulties that people have is that when you read medieval writings and when you read, let's say, the ancients, it's difficult for people to, 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 to understand because th those medieval those medieval writers were not comparing themselves to something that didn't exist yet. Like they weren't comparing their discourse to a scientific discourse because that the scientific discourse just wasn't part of their world. And so they just speak forthrightly. Yeah. And now when we look at it with our own lens, we see it just seems to be absolute gibberish. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But what's interesting is that in the transition, you can catch like in the transition between the traditional worldview and the, and the modern worldview, you can catch glimpses of people saying, oh, wait a minute. No, yeah. no, no, yeah. no, no. Don't 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 think this is like the same way that you're you're like, you know, hitting a hammer on a piece of wood. So like in Dante, for example, there's places where he actually says, he talks about ascending into heaven and, and you know, encountering the encountering higher spirits in the different heavenly spheres. And then he says, he says, no, the, 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 the spirits don't actually inhabit the heavenly sphere, the heavenly spheres. It's a condescension of the heavenly language for us to be able to understand the higher truth that we we, we speak about it in those terms and it's like well you know and he was right at the transition b before like the scientific the scientific revolution and so he was already seeing that people were changing the way they're thinking and he was trying to prevent them from getting having like a science fiction version of like a marvel comics version of of spirituality and like the gods live on other planets yes because that's what <laughs> happens that, that that's actually a good point because that's exactly what happens if you don't make the proper language shift because the words shift uh i mean if you're if you're naive you don't realize that the meaning of words shifts constantly yeah. so if like like what you're saying before water is h2o it might be that today but it's extremely naive to think that in the time of the Bible, for example, when, when the book of Genesis was written, that that's what water meant. It didn't. It meant something else. It, it, meant, it meant something. It had nothing to do with any chemical composition or anything like that. So we always have to be aware that words shift. So, for example, I mean, and there's a natural way that words shift. It, it, the words shift when your knowledge of the universe increases. So if you say, for example, earth means matter, okay? So that's what it used to mean. Hmm. And there's a reason why it meant that, because all matter came from the land, from the earth, okay? So when your, your, um, your knowledge of the universe expands, then you realize that 
there's matter that's not in the soil, in the earth. So then you have to expand your category, right? So now you invent, you, you use the word matter instead of earth, let's say. So now you've, you've separated those two categories, but they weren't separate before. When all things came from the earth, then there was a coincidence between the metaphysical category called matter and the concrete uh, reality that we call the soil, the earth. Mm -hmm. But when your knowledge expands, then the word shifts. But if you don't keep up with that shift of, of language, yeah. then you start to say things that don't make sense. Yeah, yeah and then it, things look ridiculous. You know, because... It, and and it's funny because it's it's like people who criticize the religious worldview or criticize the ancient ancient vision of the world it's like either you really have to think that everybody was on drugs or something that's what you would have to think because it's so disconnected to the materialist way of interpreting the world that it's like either they were completely delusional and lived in like a delusional world or maybe they were as smart as you were they just were talking about things in a different way yeah I, I I prefer the second because it's it's more generous and more and, and and it actually and when you explore that direction you find an amazing that's where you find amazing things you find that's where you can discover the the pearls that are hidden in in, in the ancient texts or else you know you read you read you read stories and it just seems like it's just a bunch of nonsense yeah and that and that's how atheists um, interpret it and so they're right to laugh at it they're right to mock it so. They, they, there has to be an effort to understand what the ancient language was at some point. You can't just assume that you know automatically what things, what words refer to. I mean, uh, the example I always use uh, when I talk about these things is the example of the fish. I always use that example because I think it's a, it's an easy one to understand. So I remember when I was uh, when I was a kid, um, there was this. Sunday school teacher who said something like he was talking about the story of Jonah and I don't remember who that person was but that person said well we know that Jonah wasn't swallowed by a whale because it, the text says it's a fish and whales aren't aren't fish <laughs> okay so and I was I was pretty young at, at that time I don't remember exactly maybe eight years old or something and even then I knew there was something wrong with that I knew that didn't make any sense to think that you can use a modern definition of a fish and apply it to a story that's thousands of years old. I mean, obviously, when when people talked about a fish, it didn't mean the same the same as what it means today. Like today, a prerequisite to be called a fish, I think you have to have gills. I think the animal has to have gills, but. Obviously, that's not what it used to mean. Uh, fish were things that lived in the water, and that's about it, probably. That mm -hmm. was the definition of a fish. And it wasn't a wrong definition. It wasn't an incomplete definition. It was just a different definition yeah. of fish. The word shifted. And yeah. now the word fish means something else. So we have to be careful not to use modern interpretation of words to interpret ancient stories yeah, it's, it's it was, very naive it was a, it was a it was something it was a definition like we still have definitions like that like i i use the word like i used the word grass before that's a perfect definition which is similar to the the definition of fish who just underwater i mean if you if you took the time to analyze all the different types of botanical species that are that are on the ground that you call grass you'd think like you're an idiot to say that that they're all the same. Of course, they're completely different in terms of their their species and their 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 different origins. But the that category grass is a perfectly fine category of of human engagement. So it's like, yeah, I mow the grass. I don't mow like all these. Di I won't enumerate for you all the different types of plants that I'm mowing when I'm mowing the grass. It's like it's the grass. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 it's a word that that. Um, refers to the the human experience, yeah. so that's a good example. We don't care about the scientific uh, definition of what grass is. Like we don't care what it's composed of. Really, we don't. We care about the fact that it's in our backyard and makes it look nice or something like that. But anyway, the idea is we have to be careful not to interpret ancient ancient stories with modern categories. And I keep repeating that because that's what ninety percent of the people who misread 
uh, traditional stories and biblical stories do. Yeah. So it solves about 90% of the problems that people have when, when they read a text. So when you at least try to find a proper meaning for the categories, already the problem of um, the distinction between a symbolic interpretation and a um, literal interpretation usually vanishes. It usually vanishes right there. If you, if you try to find the proper meaning of words, that dichotomy is usually enough to, to make it completely disappear. Mm. So um, one of the examples I use, I use in my mind for that, um, to show that is, um, you say, for example, uh, in the Bible, the snake in the garden, okay? If I say that's a symbol of time, the snake in the garden is a symbol of time, let's say, okay? So if you have a modern, scientific definition of time that makes no sense it looks like i'm just arbitrarily assigning a meaning to that element of the story it looks like i'm just making it up basically but if you have a proper definition of time which, which fits with with an ancient understanding then it does work it doesn't it's not arbitrary anymore because if you say for example that time used to be understood in a way where it meant um, the cause of transformation or an influence of transformation, something like that. That's what time is. Change. That's not. That's not change. Yeah, it's, it's the cause change. of change. Yeah. It's the influence of change. It's change itself. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It's not what scientists call time today. What 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 physicists call time has nothing to do with what we just said. Hmm. I mean, it, it it's become just an empty quantity used to describe. Uh, a mechanistic world in terms of times and event, events in time and space. It, it, it's not the cause of change. It's not an influence of change. I mean, in the, in the modern way, time, mm. it, it's not seen as a cause of change, but it certainly was seen as that in the ancient world. Time was a cyclical transformation, like a, a powerful influence that transformed things changing them into their opposites, actually changing light into darkness, darkness into light, right. life into death. Yeah. That was time. Yeah. So that definition of time, if you use that, then you can say the snake in the story of the garden is a symbol of time. Right. There's and no metaphor. Yeah, There's no metaphor. We, we, it is the cause of transformation in that story. Where's the metaphor? It's vanished. Yeah. Just because I use the right definition of the concept of time and I stop using the scientific mechanistic one all of a sudden when I say symbol it doesn't mean metaphor anymore it doesn't mean an allegory it means nothing of the sort the snake is a cause of transformation in the story it is a symbol of time yeah and what like what for example and one like I, I like I kind of like you know this usually is not my usual way of going about understanding symbolism but for people who, who are kind of coming at it from the outside the way that jordan the way that jordan peterson kind of traces that 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 idea that the the snake is like a symbol of time let's say is is a good way for people to kind of understand it in the sense that if you're a community let's say and and there's a predator that arrives you know uh, a, a predator that comes from the from comes into your camp that is that's exactly a perfect that's the that's the most archetypal image of change is that mm -hmm. there's a threat that comes from the 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 outside the threat it's both a threat but it's also it can also be a kind of seduction like it could be either way like it could be either a threat or a fascination or or something that appears from your the corner of your eye and that thing is going to is going to tumble it's going to make things tumble yeah. it's going to make things move yeah it can, it can potentially change yeah transform things like if it bites you, it will definitely transform yeah. <laughs> your life into death. So, so, so in that sense, symbols are not are not metaphors. They're not there, and they're certainly not arbitrary metaphors. They're certainly not conventional uh, agreements on meaning. Yeah, I think that's really. I think that's really. If we can get something out of this conversation today, I think that's really one of the biggest things that is an obstacle for people to understand symbolism is that. People constantly think that symbolism is something which is added onto literal 
facts. And and that, for example, like we both grew up in Protestant in the Protestant world, and and it not everybody, but for a lot of people who we grew up with, it it was almost as if the idea that something was had a symbolic meaning was almost like a threat to the integrity of the of the thing itself. It was almost like fact. It, like it was going to swallow up the factuality of the thing. Yeah. Uh, whereas that is not that's not how it works. It, it, the very fa the very reason why that's part of the story means that it's symbolic. It has to be, or else how would why would you care about it? Why would it be part? Why would it be set up in this pattern story? Yeah. Well, I, actually, unfortunately, it's kind of a vicious cycle because when all you have left in in a story like the Bible, in in stories, biblical stories, is the fact, then you want to defend that. Mm. If you're a Christian, let's say. When there's no more meaning, that's what I mean. It's a vicious cycle because when you have the meaning, you're more interested in the meaning than the fact, really, because mm. that's what informs you. That's what tells you <laughs> how things work. That's what shows you how reality works, and it gives you guidance as what do I do in this situation. If, if the text has meaning, it helps you understand the nature of reality. That's actually what it's really supposed to help you with. Um, but if you don't have that anymore and you only think that the text is a description of of an event without meaning, then if you want to remain a Christian, you're going to guard that with your life. Yeah, and that's the what last, they're doing. It's the last, thing it's the last remnant of, of your identity is it happened. You got to yeah. prove that it happened. You got to show that it happened. And you don't care. I don't care about the meaning. I just care that it happened. Yeah. Well, that's an, a mistake yeah. because the real um, way to understand the the Bible is through a traditional cosmology. It's the, the events that are described in the Bible are embodiments of metaphysical truth. They're embodiments of cosmic truth. They're embodiments of social truth. They're embodiments of individual truth. Mm -hmm. So at different scales of reality of our experience, there are com constant truths. So these are the truths that the Bible are trying to communicate. and. It's unfortunate that it's been lost to to a great degree, but there's work to be done. <laughs> there's work to be done. We have to do that work of reclaiming the meaning of of these things. Yeah. Just doggedly defending the factuality of of a story is is pointless. Yeah. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't help because the it's the fact contains the meaning, but it's the, the treasure is in the meaning. It's not in the, in, the, in the fact. So the whole point of the fact is to support and express and help us to understand higher meaning, spiritual meaning. Just like a scientist who performs an experiment, it's not the experiment that, that has value in itself. It's, it's, it's the general truth that the experiment reveals. So, I mean, it's interesting. I always find fascinating the story of Galileo that drops two um, two cannonballs mm -hmm. from the Tower of Pisa. Okay, I, I like that story because it's a perfect example of this dichotomy of of um, meaning and, and fact. So in that story, why do we keep retelling that story? Do we really care if it happened or not? I mean, it, it would be interesting to think that it happened. But the reason why we keep restating that story is because that specific event expresses, proves, yeah. manifests a cosmic truth, which yeah. is gravity, which is the nature of gravity. So why do we care about that event, the dropping of those two um, cannonballs at the same time from the tower, is because it proves a cosmic truth yeah. about gravity. So yeah. the same can be said about what's in the Bible it, and who, who the event of them um, dropping the two cannonballs. I mean, some people say that it actually happened. I've seen other people say that it doesn't happen. And what I say in my mind is I don't care. <laughs> I don't care that as much if it happened. I care a lot more that it revealed the nature of gravity. Right. Okay. And also, like, so, and I think that even when we use the word fact, when we talk about a story, we, as we especially if we talk about ancient stories, the, the the notion of what a fact would be in a story that's been that was told three thousand years ago is not is it doesn't mean a scientific fact. 
right? The, 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 one of the things that I've been trying to get people to see is that to remember something and to attend to something for thousands of years means that whatever it is that happened, whatever event that happened, has to be compressed. Like it has to be, it has to be brought into something that that that, that has meaning for for yeah. everyone. So like I kept thinking about you know like the idea. Let's say that you know, uh, let's say that I that, that I tell the story of a, a modern story to a, to an ancient person, and in that story the person has a has a gun in it, and that other person doesn't understand what the gun a gun is. But I can still tell the story. I just reduce it and I use the word weapon. Let's say, yeah, and exactly. then I find a word the and then maybe the word weapon in his language means a lance, and then finally it ends up being a lance. But it doesn't matter. It's the same you're, thing. You're, it's you're just still just telling the story. The, right? yeah. I'm compressing the categories in a manner which makes them universal. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be forensically the same thing for it to have. For it to be a fact, and for it because categories can be enlarged and detailed and can be compressed into more and more compressed categories. Anyway. Yeah, and that's important to understand because one of the. One of the reasons why the texts are written the way they are is because they focus on the meaning. So, I mean, we don't have the events. Like, let's say we're talking about the story of Abraham. We don't have the events anymore. We only have a story about the events. So the story was, was recounted in a certain way, and the way it was recounted, the purpose of it was so that we understand what it the means. The meaning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and we and we see that. I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking about kind of trying to find examples of that for people to to understand. And and uh, what, one of the things I kept coming coming back to was the idea of crossing a body of water. And you know, like we have in the Bible, we have the flood, then we have the crossing of the Red Sea. But then I was like, okay, let's keep going. And then it's like, oh, that's funny because we have Caesar crossing the the Rubicon. Then we have Constantine winning winning his bringing becoming emperor by b fighting a battle on a bridge. And then we have we, there's all these examples. Then you come up to Washington crossing the Delaware. It's like, why is it that all these stories of a change of power happen yeah. at the crossing, crossing of, of water. crossing of a, wa a body of water? And then some 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 cynic 200 years from now would say, oh well. Would uh, Washington None of that cross the Delaware? Yeah. You know, because exactly. of course you didn't. It's mythological. I can see that it's the same structure as Moses and and all these other mythological structures. And it's like that. No, man, that's how reality works. We remember that event because that event in in those series of events is the most conducive to bringing about the universal meaning that's in that story. It's like that's how we remembered it. Yeah. It doesn't mean not, it's not because something has a, a, a cosmic meaning that that it didn't happen. Yeah, it's ridiculous to think that. Well, that doesn't that doesn't take away from the possibility that some traditional stories are fictional. That's that's what people have to understand as well. I mean, it doesn't mean that every story is factual either. But the, what's problematic is this dichotomy, this this right. impossibility of accepting. The coexistence of a fact and a higher meaning, a general universal meaning. That's what's problematic. So it's it's what what's happening in a lot of cases is a lot of the Christians are defending a, a materialistic worldview when they do that. I, I don't know, I don't think they realize. But when they they get annoyed by um, a symbolic interpretation of the Bible, they're essentially defending their enemy. Yeah. Basically, they're defending a scientific mechanistic worldview because that's how they think. Yeah. They they might not be aware of it, but so so a lot of people, a lot of uh, religious people, not just Christians. I mean, a lot of religious people are essentially materialists. Yeah, and it's but, and, but they they believe in God. They happen to believe in God, but they're still materialists in the, every other way, in every other way. And the, but no. the materialism has two sides, and it's interesting in terms of meaning because what, what you happens is you meet you meet like conservative type Christians, and they're literal, like they're they're real materialists in the sense that they read the Bible and they see it as like 
what's written there. That's what happened in the same way that I, you know, ate my, my muffin this morning and, you know, and I, you know, I cut my mustache. Like, it's the same level. Like, it's the same level. Then you meet liberal Christians who are like, oh, pff, you know, like, whatever what happened in the Bible, that doesn't, yeah. none of that happened. You know, it's all these stories. And then they, so like, then yeah, it's those, the other side of the coin. Right? And then those liberal types, they, they, then they feel like that it's their, now that they can interpret it in whatever way they want, because it doesn't really matter anyway. So then they come up with crazy interpretations. So then the conservative Christians, they go crazy because they're like, yeah, well, if, they're we, right. yeah. if we agree that there's meaning in these, if there's symbolism in these stories, look at them. We don't want to be like them. Yeah. We don't want to be these, these crazy falutin people and the other people on the on the top on the on the on the like liberal side they're looking at the conservatives and they're thinking what a bunch of morons like they really think that there was a snake on you know who like in an apple and and then like two naked people like what a bunch of idiots so it's yeah. like there's just crazy it's two sides of the same two, coin they're just two sides of the same yeah. coin like it, it's like, a detachment it's it's that's the idea symbolism is the union of fact and meaning yeah so both, if you if you lose that union, if you use the possibility of, of a union like that, then yeah, you either fly up into heaven, you, 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 you lose your mind, you interpret it however the heck you want, and it doesn't matter, there's no reason or rhyme to it, it's just anything goes, yeah. or you just refuse completely to have any kind of meaning, and you just stick to the fact. So one of them keeps the fact, and the other one keeps the meaning, but goes a little bit crazy, because when you get detached from facts, your ideas, your, your theories about what things mean can go fly off in any direction. But if you remain attached to a fact, it, it limits what you can say about it. It limits the meaning that, that you can you can give it. Yeah. One of the one of the theories that I've had for like the, the modern age is that it's been it's been like a de incarnation. Like it's it's taken it's been like a, a, a taking the idea of like let's say the human and divine nature of Christ and like ripping them apart and creating these two, these two, these two like wild opposites. Cause we often see modernism in terms of materialism and everything, but there's a whole other like occultist, occultic, like the occultism and, and new age and, and all these kind of spiritist type movements that are the, the, the counterweight of the more kind of scientific materialism that's there. And those two things develop at the same time, like Descartes, René Descartes was developing his mechanical scientific things and then he spent the rest of his, the most of his life like searching for the rosy cross like looking for some esoteric you know invisible society yeah something that's yeah that's detached from reality yeah. basically that's not concrete well that's what's ironic about all this all this stuff is the people who are preserving the true spirit of traditional thought are scientists because they care about the union mm. of meaning and fact. Yeah. They care about the fact as much as they care about the theory. They don't just want theories. They don't just want facts. They want true knowledge is joining meaning and fact together, theory and fact. So like a, a universal theory and with particular facts, that's what, that's their job. They're still doing that. So they're preserving that spirit. It's, it's completely ironic. The scientists are the ones who are m the most um, good at preserving the union that we're supposed to be preserving as religious people. So it's it's a little bit ironic. <laughs> because, but at the same time, it's it's kind of their fault that we lost it. Yeah. At the same time, because they're materialists, so they don't view. Um, the theory as something real, they view yeah. it as completely artificial, and that, well, that could it, it could be argued that that's their problem. Their main problem is they view ma the facts, the matter is real, but they don't view the theory that they're using to interpret the fact as real. Yeah. Why is it not real? It, it's it's not material, perhaps. Why did why is it not real? Well, there you go. Because they're materialists. If yeah. something is not material, they assume that it's it has no reality whatsoever. But it's a strange way of thinking. Yeah, and because they use, and they use math, like they use math. And they use math. math is it's real. <laughs> there you go. It's a kind of a real. It's not a material. Yeah, mathematical structures patterns are real. They're not real in the sense that they are physical. That that's stupid. They're real in the sense that they are universal. They're actually more real than uh, individual facts. Yeah.
I mean, a mathematical pattern has more reality, has more universality, has more uh, applications, implications than uh, any fact I could find. Yeah. So, so why is it not real? Yeah. It's real. It's more yeah, real it's, than real. And and the hierarchy of value is the same thing because you can't they can't avoid it. Like they even though when they're doing their hardcore science they try to avoid it. You know when they're even justifying why you would study something rather than study something else. They have to put it in a hierarchy of values. There's no way of avoiding it. You can't you can't get around it. Yeah, it's one of those structures like mathematics. It's one of those structures that are so real that there's no way out of it. Yeah. You can you can't get out of it. Even by denying it, you're probably going to enter into that framework of of, uh, of meaning. So. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I think is a big deal is that, I mean, I've had people who have written me who are interested in symbolism. And what happens, the, the, the problem that happens when people start to discover symbolism is that, not always, but often they kind of go a bit insane. Like they go crazy. They start seeing, when they start seeing connections between things, it's as if some strange valve is opened up in their mind. And it's like they the like drank a gallon of wine, and it's like, wow, you know, everything's connected. And then they, they write these long, I've, I've gotten these long emails of people who like just connect things together, and it's just completely crazy. And this is the, one of the reasons why uh, rational people don't want to have anything to do with symbolism, because <laughs> a lot of people end up making all kinds of weird connections, and it's, it's clearly irrational. It's based on largely on personal experience and that's what they want to avoid which i understand so the idea is like so what so let, let's talk about this what could what could we say are some of the criteria by which we know that something is has meaning by which we know something is is worth attending to and, and is and is actually connected to something else okay so yeah the the criteria Let's say you you're interpret you you give an interpretation of a, a narrative in the Bible, let's say, or an element in the Bible in a story. So how how what criteria can we use to determine if this interpretation is just some crazy association, or if it's something that's valid, if it's 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 a valid um, meaning that's given to this event in the Bible or this part of the story. So. The way I see it is it's exactly the same as what scientists use to determine if uh, a scientific knowledge is valid. It's, first of all, you have to look at consistency, okay? So if somebody says, uh, I'm going to use the example of the snake again like I did before. If somebody says, the snake is a symbol of, I don't know, what do people usually say when they don't know what they're talking about? It's a symbol of good fortune and fertility, or something like that. That's an exact, that's what people usually someone, say when they don't understand symbolism. Yeah, well, usually when people don't really understand symbolism, they always, everything's a symbol of fertility for some reason, okay? So, <laughs> so that's, so how do you know if it, an interpretation like that is valid? Well, you have to look at consistency. So if, you read the rest of the Bible, and then there's other examples of a snake. Right. And then your your interpretation of the snake fits nowhere except at that particular first example that you were looking at. Then you you don't have it. You're wrong. Think again. Okay. Yeah. So that's. So it's 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 like the same thing as science. I mean, if you have a theory about reality, and it it only applies to a very specific phenomenon, then keep working. I mean, you don't have anything. You're just describing it. You just made up a theory to describe just that fact. You, you're, you're trying to have a universal theory that explains a specific fact. So it has to apply to different examples, different phenomena, not just the one. So it's the same thing if you're interpreting a symbol. You don't want it to work on just that story. It's ridiculous. It has to work all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you say the snake is a symbol of fertility, then it, uh, Look at all the other examples of the snakes in the Bible. Does it does it make sense? The answer is no. So it's not that. Uh, so that's one criteria. Another one, uh, which goes with the first one, really, is it has to be comprehensive. So it has to be in include a lot of um, the stories. So if you have a specific pattern that you use to interpret a story, that pattern you should be able to use it to interpret 
a lot of other stories. So if you say, for example, one of the most fundamental patterns in, in, in ancient cosmology is the tree, okay? The tree, the snake, those are usually seen as opposites. So if that's true, then you should find the tree, that pattern, you should be able to find it in a whole lot of other stories. Right. So if you use that, if you think that pattern is fundamental, then fundamental means it explains a whole lot of things. So just like a scientific theory, like let's say the um, theories in, in relation to gra gravity, you should be able to explain a lot of phenomenon with that single theory. If you don't, there's you're missing some some point. You're missing a simpler truth, a more universal truth. So that's that's the other thing. Um, well, the other I would say criteria is. Does it provide insight? If you have an interpretation of a, of a symbol and it, it provides you with zero insight into the nature of this story, into the facts that follow and the facts that precede it, it's worthless. What's the point? So I think you were talking about that at the beginning. You were saying about interpreting things horizontally. Were you talking about that before? No, we talked that before our conversation. One okay, before. I, I can mention that. One of the yeah, things go ahead. that we see with symbolism one of the problems that we see with symbolism is is is, is the kind of a uh, is the I'm going to probably do a video about this, but it's like the conspiracy version of symbolism, where symbolism is interpreted like on a, on on the same level, and so an image doesn't refer to a higher reality or to a more let's say unitive, universal universal yeah. truth. It it only it's only a code that hides a secret like. Uh, a secret meaning of something someone's trying to hide from you, like the fact that maybe they're aliens, or, or yeah. you know, like there's this secret society that wants to some for some reason they yeah, want to they want to hide, hide it. their communication, but then make it available for others, like that type of symbolism. Yeah. Like who cares about that stuff? Like, yeah, that doesn't it, give you it exists. Into, it doesn't help you live your life. Yeah, and what what's <laughs> it, it, it? The funny thing is that type of symbolism does exist, yeah, but it's sure. absolutely secondary. I mean, if you want to understand the Bible, forget about that. You're, you're not. It's not going to help you to understand anything. So, yeah, but I had and I had I've seen an example of that. Uh, I don't remember exactly where, but it was somebody who was trying to interpret the story of Elijah, and he was talking about the raven that feeds Elijah, and then the interpretation of the person was, well. The raven actually refers to a secret society oh my goodness that went and fed elijah okay that was the interpretation i don't remember where i got that from that's but... a lateral interpretation and in my in my mind when i saw that i was thinking to myself that gives no understanding of the story whatsoever it it doesn't give any more understanding to the story than to say that it's a raven not at all so that's an example of a of a faulty interpretation. It provides you with no higher understanding of a specific story. Yeah. So the idea, just like just like a scientific theory, you find a scientific theory. Why is it valuable? Because it allows you to understand a whole bunch of things. Yeah. That's it's the same thing with this uh, symbolic interpretation. You have certain patterns that are universal, and if you use these patterns to interpret the story, it will reveal the nature of the story to you. It will make it obvious. It will make it clear. Just like a theory reveals the nature of, of reality when it works, when it's right. Of course, it has to be correct. If you have a wrong theory, then it doesn't help you at all. Same thing with an interpretation. If you have a wrong interpretation, it will mislead you. But if you're honest, if you're honest about it, you'll see that it doesn't work. If you're dishonest, so you can always fool yourself. Of course, anybody can do that. But, but that's not. This is one of the reasons why certain people are against the idea of a symbolic interpretation. Is they're worried about this possibility of interpreting things however you want. Yeah. But that problem is an everyday problem. It's not just a problem of interpreting the Bible. I mean, the problem of having a faulty interpretation of reality. Is, an, is a problem that everyone's faced with. So it doesn't go away when you, all of a sudden you, you, you refuse to do it with a biblical narrative. It's something we do every single day in, in everyday life. We interpret reality with a theory. Mm -hmm. If we're wrong, we're Just, screwed. Yeah, it hurts us, it harms us. So that, that problem doesn't disappear. It's always there. So 
it's there when you interpret the Bible too. It's there when you interpret some something that somebody tells you outside or at your job. Mm -hmm. It's always there. So there's no way out of that, of the, out of that problem. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the one of the craziest ones, the, the craziest ones that someone wrote me recently about about that and, and about this type of lateral interpretation of symbolism, where it's like every symbol that he could come up with was basically a symbol for mushrooms. It was basically like drugs. Yeah, drugs. It was all drugs. And it's like, you know, that doesn't help. Like, how does that help you? Like, why would you read a story that hides? It's all a hidden code hides, for drugs. Like, that hides references to drugs in it. Like. But the how, funny thing is, the funny thing is, the, the funny, the funny <laughs> part of that is, if that person has the right understanding of what intoxication is, right. then that person would be able to find places in the Bible that actually are about intoxication and understand the deep meaning of intoxication. See, so if that person had the right, honest mind frame about understanding a story, then his fetish about intoxication <laughs> would be would be would be uh, answered in in the Bible because intoxication is part of of the Bible. There's there's yeah, the story of Noah. He drinks Noah, wine, yeah. and I mean it's not absurd to say, for example, that um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a form of intoxication. Yeah, I mean if if he interprets like interprets it like that. But see, that's, you, not, that's not what they're doing. What they, you what can they say, doing, yes, you're right. They're saying it's a, it's like a, a hidden veil. It's a hidden meaning, which is to show that that you know ancient people took mushrooms to to have to have like spiritual experiences. Like that's what the story means. It's like I'm not. I don't even know. I'm not even denying that maybe ancient people took mushrooms to have spiritual experiences. But it's like, does that really think that that story? Like that's the point yeah, of that story? What, like the, yeah, that the, yeah. The, the when whole, it is. Like the, when it is, it is. And Western civilization is just about someone taking mushrooms. Like, my goodness. No, I don't think you're you're very good at building a civilization when you're always high on mushrooms. I, don't, I doubt it. <laughs> but the funny thing is that that symbolism is important yeah, yeah, in, is. in the yeah, Bible. Yeah. It, it is important. And that's the thing. When you have a, a an honest approach, you will find those places in but the Bible. Also, but not just honest, but also a, a desire to go to more unitive forms of meaning instead yeah, it's of it's not all about being intoxicated that's for not sure. just not just about being intoxicated but about act but about this idea of a veiled a veiled illusion to some some like social practice that, mm -hmm. that they're not talking about so it's like it yeah, doesn't yeah. even show you the meaning of intoxication it's just to show you that people used to take mushrooms and now they're hiding it from yeah. you and because yeah, the, the, the church is hiding from you that 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 people used to take mushrooms because they they're they're evil and they want don't want you to know that that's a way to they want to control spirituality so they're hiding the fact that people used to take mushrooms but it's still there kind of you know lingering in the stories and it's like it's all about people used to take mushrooms it's like yeah that well that that's uh, like, yeah it's a good example about the nature of the universe <laughs> it doesn't even tell you anything about the nature of taking mushrooms but the, yeah, that's it's it's, it's a good it's, example of uh, what you were saying of a of a horizontal interpretation. Yeah. You just replace something with something with else. Something else. Yeah. It's like symbolism is just a replacement of one thing by another that means something else. So that's not what symbolism is. It's the opposite of what symbolism is actually. <laughs> symbolism, the idea of true symbolism, is to reveal things, not to hide them. It's reveal things that we usually wouldn't understand easily because they're too abstract yeah they're so it's this exactly the same thing as as an, a scientific experiment you're performing a, an experiment it makes the abstract concrete it makes it real yeah. and then you can recognize it so like like the example <coughs> i was giving before of um dropping the two cannonballs from the tower of galileo well it's an event which has cosmic meaning cosmic implications because it reveals the nature of gravity so the whole point of that is not to hide the nature of gravity it's to reveal it in an event mm -hmm. so yeah so the the idea that symbolism is like a crypto language or something like that a cryptic way of talking with opposites <laughs> Because that's what it ends up being. Yeah. Is, yeah. It's completely false. That's, I think. I think that comes from. I think that comes from what I was talking about before. Like that something happened in the late Middle Ages or the or during the Renaissance, where there was this split 
you know, of uh, of like the more kind of literal things, and then the the higher falutin type of of uh, spiritualism, let's say occult occultism and all that stuff. It seems like that's part of it. Like the, the and so the whole tradition of secret societies in the West and stuff had they they, they did have that idea somehow of hiding. You know, yep. like Freemasons have that idea of like hiding. You know, the the, the I think. The I think when they have that idea, it's because they've lost the meaning. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. I mean, I've recently read some some people talking about the meaning of uh, Freemason stuff, and it was supposedly written by a Freemason. And I was I I had I was amazed at how dumb it was, how <laughs> what it was saying. Because when I looked at their symbolism, I I thought it was it made sense. Yeah, it was, uh, I talk, I it was expressing universal truth. But what, when I looked at the explanation that the person who wrote the book was giving, yeah. was, who was supposedly a Freemason, in my mind I was saying, you yeah. lost your symbolism. Yeah, no, you I, lost your own symbolism, and now you're, you're trying to explain it as a cryptic thing, but it's the only reason you're doing that is because you've lost it. You don't know what it is. You yeah. don't have what it takes to get to understand it. So you're trying to give it some other meaning that has nothing to do with with what it is that's why i would see it anyway <laughs> no i it was the same i had the same experience i i yeah i spoke i spoke uh, with it two years ago with a 33rd degree mason and i was i'd never met like a high level high ranking mason before so i was like i was asking a lot of questions and they were telling me about some of the symbolism that they have and i was like oh that's actually pretty interesting like they but, they have like they have like this uncut stone and cut yeah, stone, the cu like yeah. uncut wall and cut wall and I was like wow that's actually like really it's traditional like, yeah, it's, it's traditional like, symbolism but then it's like it, and I was trying to get him like to talk about it and it was like there was nothing beyond it like it was just there was yeah. no there was no sense anyways yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right I think yeah. that now that we've now that we've entered like. Uh, Talking about Freemasonry, I think that means it's a time to finish our conversation. <laughs> All right, so I want to, just for the people watching, so we tried, Matthew and I, we tried to to say things, to speak in a way that's understandable as much as possible, but we're so used to discussing symbolism together that it's possible that that that, that maybe sometimes we're off. So I'm I'm asking all of you guys in the comment section to uh, to go ahead and 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 ask questions or to uh, to tell us if we're how we're, if our aim is right like if our if the level that we're aiming at in in the way we're describing things if it's at the right level so uh, so hopefully Matt, Mathieu will agree to do this again with me that would be great I hope I hope he does and like I said I we announced this uh, during Jordan's uh, the interview with Jordan Matt, Matthew just. He's finishing a book now. It's not totally finished, but he's almost finished a book about symbolism, which really explores the the structures in a very concise and very powerful way. And so we're we're haven't figured out how we're going to get that out to people if if we're going to have it published by someone, if we're going to self publish, if he's going to self publish. But just so you know that that's on the horizon and that it's it's gonna we're gonna keep announcing the steps at, at, of that coming towards you. So so I hope you all enjoyed this video.